Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 382. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm bringing you part two of my conversation with Isabel Stenzel Burns talking about grief. If you listened last week, Isabel shared a bit about her experience as someone who was born with cystic fibrosis, and she and her twin sister both had it, and they both had lung transplants. And she talks about what it was like to be a child living with a terminal illness at the time. It was common for children to not survive to adulthood during the time that she was born. And thankfully, that has changed, but it's still a very serious illness. And she talked about the experience of losing peers when she was a child who had the same illness that she had, the same disease. And she talked about losing her sister. She was working as a hospice social worker and very committed to that work. Isabel now herself is living with cancer. As I learned when I went to re-release this episode And that makes this conversation, I think, have even more depth, knowing that what I found really beautiful about speaking with Isabel in both of our interviews was her her open perspective about grief and loss and end of life, that she had a really philosophical view of life and life cycles. And I found it very helpful at the time when the second episode was released. I was dealing with grief myself and preparing emotionally or trying to prepare to lose one of my parents who then later did not pass away and is still living, which I'm thankful for. So none of us gets through life without being touched by grief and loss. In fact, if you love, you will lose. And if you never love, then life is pretty isolating. So if we are brave enough to open our hearts, they will be broken at some point. And that's all part of it. I don't like it, but it's true. (laughs) So I wanted to share this conversation with you. And it goes more in depth than our part one did. And I hope you will find it useful share it with someone who needs to hear the words of wisdom that are shared here. Check out Isabel's film, The Power of Two, about her relationship with her sister. They made the film together before her sister passed away. What she does, what Isabel and her sister have done will live far beyond their lives. And I think it's meaningful. In fact, as I'm recording this now, I'm I'm realizing that if One way to make painful experiences have more meaning is if you can share them with others for their benefit. And so that's something important. And I think it's an argument for why we shouldn't hide away when we're in pain, but that by sharing our pain and our joy and a full range of human emotions is how we live. It's how we're supposed to be. So I hope you'll enjoy this conversation. And next week, I'll bring you the second part of my conversation with Linda Tai, 
that we started in episode 380. That's a another beautiful exploration as well. And I thank you very much for listening and talk to you soon. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I am so honored and appreciative to be speaking with someone who has been on the podcast before and we had such a beautiful conversation our first time. My guest today is Isabel Stenzel Burns, LCSW. Isabel, thanks so much for returning to Therapy Chat today. Thank you, Laura. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me again. You're so welcome. I'm so glad that we're talking again because in our first conversation, when we were talking about grief, we had, I thought, a really beautiful discussion, but we ran out of time to get into really talking about the subject of grief therapy, which is really what I think, you know, the concept of grief is one thing for people to really reflect on, but the the process of what grief therapy looks like is you know, can be a real mystery. And I think it would be great for us to demystify that a bit for people who might be curious about getting some counseling or therapy for their grief and just, you know, kind of don't know what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I'm, I work at a hospice. I can tell you that grief counseling in a hospice may be different than grief therapy outside in a private practice. But I can certainly give an overview of how we approach our grieving clients, both clients who have a hospice um, death, but also clients from the community. That sounds perfect. So just in case anyone who's listening didn't hear our first episode, let's take a second for you to kind of give a little introduction to yourself and just tell our audience about what you do. Sure. Thank you. I am proud to be an LCSW. I work as a grief counselor and coordinator here at Mission Hospice and Home Care. We're down in San Mateo, California. We are a private, independent, nonprofit hospice. And I previously worked as a bereavement fellow at a children's hospital. And then most of my prior social work before that was with children with chronic illness. So I have always worked with people with the medical challenges, and now I'm sort of on the other side, sitting with uh, family members who are reviewing and reflecting their journey, taking care of somebody, following their illness path, and then losing them, and then trying to start life again without that person in their lives. So I do primarily individual counseling, but I also do quite a bit of grief support groups, um, I do a writing through loss group. It's all part of my job, a holiday support group. It's There's always something exciting going on, and it feels strange to use the word exciting, but it's very fulfilling and rewarding to see people discover their own resilience and to adapt to their losses and to find joy again. So I do I do love my job. I do love my work. Yeah, and I really get what you mean about it's strange to say exciting, but it's exciting to know how much people can heal and how, how powerful the work can be. I, you know, since I specialize in trauma, it's like, I love talking about trauma. It's not like I like that people experience trauma, but I love being able to help people heal from trauma because, you know, when they're going through the painful effects of it, you know, they may feel like there's, it's never going to get better. So it's very exciting to see just how, yeah. how powerful therapy can be. Yep, exactly. To sort of help people find themselves, know themselves, and then, you know, just be more self-aware. That's, that's what I love about this work. And grief counseling, I think is, it has, in any counseling, there's a self-selection where people who know they're struggling with someone choose to come into our offices. But I think, therefore, we have like active mourners, you know, people who want to do something for their grief. But I also think in the grieving community and also perhaps the tra trauma survivors, they are at such a vulnerable place. They've never experienced the intensity of emotions or dysregulation ever before in their lives. You know, most of us have a, a life partner and to lose that life partner 
it, it's it's a whole new chapter. And so we get to witness what they do, you know, when they're stuck in this deep, dark hole of loss and um, how much I also enjoy kind of exploring a person's sense of control, their confidence, whether they believe that they themselves, their self-efficacy can do something to, to feel better. Much of grief counseling is about normalizing and validating a person's experience. I think the, like any counseling, the most important factor is just sitting back and listening and listening actively to what they're going through. And it's such a gift to be able to have somebody in front of me who's so open to sharing their story and where they are. It's beautiful. So I know that it might seem obvious, but can you can you kind of start off by just talking about sort of how you see grief and your perspective on it? Yes, definitely. And I think it's an important question because how how the therapist sees grief will inform how the the, the session goes, how the course of treatment is planned. And so, as I mentioned in my prior session with you, I grew up with a, a life-threatening illness and I had a number of peers with my illness, cystic fibrosis die. And so all of that informed how I see grief and I see life as being incredibly beautiful and incredibly hard and unfair and that grief is a normal response, a natural response to the loss of something that we treasure. And for me, I think grief has a purpose. It, it's a form of love. And that's the line. That's sort of the cliche in grief counseling. Grief is a form of, of love. And so when we love someone or something so deeply and then we lose that, that person or that thing, then we feel that response um, when we're attached to something deeply. And when that thing is taken away, then we feel that reaction. And so I think that informs my, my sessions because it's the most natural experience, but it's also incredibly intense, mm -hmm. especially certain ways that people die. Like, as, like, like your work, we hear so many different stories I do a suicide loss group. I do counseling for people who've lost loved ones to suicide. And that's that's a traumatic loss. But there's also people who have uh, various illnesses and maybe they become disfigured or maybe they, you know, have a traumatic death. And so having to help somebody work through what they witnessed and um, find ways to understand what happened in a different way is really kind of I, those are the nuances of grief counseling, but they're all informed by this idea that grief is a natural response to loss. And there's nothing wrong with the person. There's no pathologizing. Um, there's no diagnosing. It's really witnessing intimately a, a person's story, sort of a, a, a climax or a in their plot of their lives, a climax or a conflict in their story and seeing how they find ways to overcome the obstacles and the upheaval in their lives. Yeah. And I think that I sense that when helping someone who is going through the grief process, the therapist's knowledge of what sort of what lies ahead and understanding of what's going on seems really important. Yes, for sure. And I think people often express like, I am I doing this right? They say, am I grieving right? What do you think? How am I doing? And they want some validation that what they're going through is, is um, normal. And also underneath that is what I see as somebody who might maybe be judging what they're doing. Am I, am I doing this wrong? Am I grieving enough? Am I not grieving hard enough? And so I reflect that to them. I'm the mirror often spouses or family members become like a mirror to us to give us a sense of self and self self identity and confidence and then suddenly that person that attachment figure is taken away and they come to us come to grief counselors or therapists to be their temporary mirror and i think also my job is to witness and and be a companion as somebody travels through their first year of grief as a hospice, we cannot see people long term because of the volume of 
clients. Mm. Um, so I see we see them about 13 months if um, needed. And 13 months is just a general time frame set by Medicare that reimburses most hospices and uh, not most hospices, reimburses all hospices. And so the first year going through the first, the first birthday, the first holidays, the first summertime, the first memories of certain dates that are significant can help someone kind of give them confidence that they can endure really painful emotions and also help them recognize that one month, three months, five months, 10 months, they're seeing some progress in their adapting to the loss emotionally as well as practically, that they are capable of going on vacation without their loved one. They are capable of building some new relationships. So again, we're we're gently, you know, listening, but also guiding and supporting them to make choices for themselves that will help them move forward in their lives. I never use the word move on because we carry grief with us forever. We just find a, a place for it in our lives, a smaller place. In the first year, it's quite dominant, but we help people, you know, focus on maybe other aspects of their lives to take a break from that intensity of their loss and then go back and address it as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it seems so complicated because, you know, there's like how I feel day to day you know, if I, if I'm, when I say I, meaning I would be the client, how I feel day to day, and then how I'm going to go forward from here. And then also, you know, when there's a traumatic loss, then, you know, there, there can be the trauma symptoms that can be part of it as well. Yeah. I don't know. Like, it seems like through the first year, it's like getting through that year with all those firsts. And I've seen people at the end of that first year say, I feel like it just hit me that this is real. Exactly. Yes. Yes. We always talk about grief having emotional symptoms, of course, physical symptoms, you know, that knot in your throat, your gastrointestinal distress, spiritual symptoms, asking why God would allow this. But we don't always talk about the chronological symptoms of grief. I, I consider them, that's what I label them as. The sense of time becomes so distorted that a person who may have been gone for one week and it feels like an eternity, or they may have been gone for one year and it feels like a speck of time. And so that's all part of that, almost a disassociation, of, a, a feeling of being disassociated from the reality that also there's sometimes a sense of feeling confidence. Oh, I could, I could survive. I could survive one whole year now since they've been gone or a sense of guilt. You know, I've lived a light one more year and, and they didn't get that chance. So having to grapple with all of those feelings, I think is, is all part of my job to sort of remem- remind people that it's normal. And you mentioned like, it's very complicated. Grief is extremely complicated. There's so many layers and a person's life story, their relationships, their personality variables, like all of those things will play a role in how a person grieves. Their early attachment plays a role in how they're grieving. But then there's something called complicated grief. <laughs> so we call that prolonged grief or prolonged grief disorder. So I'm as a, as a therapist, I'm always mindful of kind of keeping an eye on potential thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that could be a sign of complicated grief or prolonged grief. If this person doesn't resolve certain issues, it could predict and be a risk factor for prolonged grief. So I just share that because I'm, I'm not just listening. <laughs> I'm not just listening and validating. It's a very, you know, it requires quite a bit of clinical astuteness, just like any therapist, right? You're looking for some red flags to make sure the person is adapting as well as possible to their loss. Yeah. Assessment is just, it's a continuous part of what we do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So since you brought up complicated grief, and I definitely want to talk about that a bit more, but can you describe maybe what are some of the normal reactions to grief or I don't know if normal would be the right word but typical and typical. then yeah and then how 
how someone might realize if they are dealing with complicated grief, because what I see is that people who are grieving are always like, why am I still feeling this way? Ooh, it would be over this by now. Shouldn't I be over this by now? But, you know, people who have trauma, which is my clients, also say that. So <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I think so much of that is cultural. We live in a culture where we expect things to be fixed very quickly. We expect, you know, grief to look like the common cold where we get it, we have a few days of misery and then we're better. And grief, I think our job is to teach, teach our clients that grief is a new chapter in your life. It is like a chronic condition, but it's not, there's nothing wrong with you to have grief. In the beginning, it might feel like you have to lug around a, a bag of heavy lead and it, that's what grief feels like. It's just very heavy and common feelings are exhaustion, fatigue, lack of pleasure. Con and the most significant symptom, of course, is yearning, preoccupation with the person who has died, wishing they were still here. Like any therapy, I often ask people in the beginning when we start is, what are your goals for our time together? What would you like to get out of counseling? And most of my clients say something like, I just miss them so much. I, I, want, to, I want them back. And in, when someone has just died two weeks ago or two months ago even, that's a natural response. It's a hard goal to have in counseling because it's not possible to do that. But it's very hard for people to articulate what their goals are because they're kind of in this state of shock and um, disorganization and they don't have an easy, quote, presenting problem. Their problem is grief, <laughs> which has so many different layers. And so we tease that apart. Like, let's look at the consequences of your grief. So your mother has died or your spouse has died. What are the hardest things? things for you right now and really kind of narrow it down. And maybe it might be, you know, taking on new roles and responsibilities in a household or now coping with loneliness and being alone after this person has been with them in the house for 50 years sometimes. So adapting to loneliness and sometimes the consequences are things like family conflict. You know, my, my daughters aren't talking to me anymore or something like that. And we address that. Other things might be basically intense stress response. I believe grief is a form of intense stress. So not being able to sleep, not feeling like eating, feeling very exhausted and tense. And so we address those. A lot of my approach is teaching stress management, something as basic as, as mindful breathing or, you know, self-care, like a little physical activity or making sure the person has a balanced meal, balanced diet. So basic stress management, how to downregulate the body. It's, it's similar to trauma work, I think, helping people find a, some kind of calm amidst the chaos of loss. The other things I think that we see are, and I'm just trying to, there's so much I'm trying to narrow it down here. <laughs> I think automatically with, with the yearning and the wishing the person didn't die and wanting to have life stand still and not change like this, I think a lot of people have to review the illness. They have to review the death, what happened. They have to tell the story of the death. And that has a, an important function. First of all, many times they say they never told anybody what happened. So they, this is a very intimate story that they think that other people don't want to hear or it's too mm -hmm. hard to share things with others. But here I'm, you know, opening and creating a, a safe space for that. And with that comes some movement towards accepting the reality of the death by telling the story, what happened, what they saw, what they went through through what kind of trauma they witnessed. And I do want to emphasize that there's a lot of horrible trauma out there, but even a natural death in a hospice, in a bed, can be traumatic for the family member, especially if they've never witnessed anything like this before. And sometimes the body does things and the body looks a certain way that can be very difficult for a person who's not familiar with dying to witness. 
So does that make sense? Yeah. And I just want to say that as someone who has has witnessed a very dear loved one's death and through they were in hospice, it was my grandmother, how I just want to say thank you, as I think I said in our first interview, but thank you for being a hospice social worker, because for us, I, in a very short time, a very brief period of illness because of the type of cancer and her age, the hospice social worker explained what what was likely to happen. And it, it really helped take away some of the fear and yeah. horror type response that could have happened because it was like, okay, I understand what's happening and what this means. Also, you know, in a very short time, my perspective shifted from like, fear of death and death is a bad thing to this is natural it's beautiful you know and like even though I still grieved that part helped the dying process be as as painless as it could have been for me as the person who wasn't dying mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. right we we um no I I hear that and and th- and I'm sorry for your grandmother's death but also what you're describing is most people say they want to have a peaceful death surrounded by family. And we in a hospice try to provide that. And it's very different if you were in ICU with lots of tubes around you and beeping machines. And that sort of death can be also very traumatic, but it it doesn't lend itself to the things that make life most valuable, you know, being um, surrounded by people you love and having some control over a difficult situation. We call it, you know, death is difficult. Death is hard in our culture. And, and, and just as a matter of fact, death is hard. But I think what you're describing is that your grandmother, given that her body was shutting down, she had a good death. Mm-hmm. Um, one that, you know, was comfortable, was at home, and that family members, not necessarily strangers, could take care of her. Right. And the fact that we were more at peace with what was happening probably eased the transition for her where, you know, she probably would have been in distress if we were so distressed about what was happening. Right. If you had to leave because the visiting hours were over or something like that. Yeah. 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 And, And definitely, I mean, in hospice, the family is the unit of care. And so the whole philosophy of the hospice is, of course, emotional, psychosocial comfort for the patient and the family. And providing that kind of education of what's natural and normal in the dying process can definitely help families be more calm. And what what the patient needs in their final moments and days is calm and quiet. Yes, exactly. So I just wanted to name the importance of that in that dying process when you have the opportunity to have that. I mean, obviously, it's not always possible because, first of all, not everyone is in hospice. And, you know, sometimes people die very suddenly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And even within hospice, I mean, some diseases and some situations are are somewhat chaotic and can be very difficult and need need to be debriefed. And that's what we're here for particularly in bereavement, but the whole team, our social workers, nurses, our physicians are all here to help a family understand what happened if the death didn't go as expected. I, I, I'm not sure if I said this in the prior podcast, but it's sort of my motto, which is people die the way they live. And so if somebody is feisty and wants control and is used to having their way or whatever their personality traits, those all show up at the end of life. And plus there's the natural physical process of dying. And so things happen, lots of different things happen at the end of life that then families witness and have to learn to cope with. 
Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience. And one thing that has made it so much easier is Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn, it's intuitive, the customer support is second to none. And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. Yeah. So when we, when you were talking and you said people who have witnessed their loved one's death have to talk about it, do you mean they have to in order to heal or do you mean that they feel they have to? Well, it almost happens naturally. Yeah. It's some sort of normal kind of need to tell the story of what happened. And it's just like if we had a big event happen in our life and then we meet someone for the first time, we often have an instinct to want to share what happened. Yeah. Um, a good good thing that happened to us, like, you know, winning the lottery or something, you know, getting uh, a new car. We want to go tell someone about it and how we yeah. that place. And so it's really interesting to see the patterns. One of the things we say is grief is a very individual. Everyone grieves their own way, but there's certainly patterns in how we grieve. And so most of my clients walk into my office and tell me the story of what happened and with vivid detail, like they can remember the time of day, they can remember, you know, wh what the positioning of the bed was or the patient. And we know that's a form of trauma, sort of recalling intense memory intense yeah. details of the mem of what happened. And and sometimes they tell it again and again, but but usually it's just once. And sometimes going back to it, if there was something that troubled them about the deaths, for example, guilt. Guilt is a normal, a natural part of grief. And so if there was something that happened at the end of life that made them feel like they didn't do something or they should have done something else, then they will naturally kind of revisit that story and my job and any therapist's job is to help them see that story in a different way and understand their actions and their situation in a different way. Yeah. I mean, it really feels like that witnessing that, yeah. you know, people need to be witnessed. They need someone to hear what they went through and just understand and, and let them share how they feel about it. And just it's like, Instead of being alone with it, I need someone else to know this happened and it really mattered. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It mattered. It mattered for all kinds of reasons. Yes. So where is the where is the line? And I don't know if it's so clear, but of complicated grief, like yeah. what what makes complicated grief different? Right. OK, well, my greatest mentor is doc Dr. Catherine Shear. She's at Columbia University. She has the Center for Complicated Grief, and she has developed an amazing curriculum for complicated grief. So much of what I want to say is going to be from her and quoting her. I just want to give a shout out to Dr. Yeah. Catherine Shear. I've heard great things about her from you and many other people, and I welcome her if she's listening. If she hears yeah. her ears burning right now, she's welcome to join me on this podcast. Yes, yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Well, so as I said, we see a pattern. We see a pattern in people who are acutely grieving. What I mean by acute is, you know, usually the first year and that we all know that grief comes in waves, um, waves of intense emotion, sadness, crying, yearning, and then it kind of subsides. Whereas depression is sort of constant, right? This constant low feeling and sadness. So you can kind of tell it it's different. And then you see even in the day after someone dies, moments, glimpses of pleasure. So that's all part of the waves. I had a, a father whose son took his own life and he was telling me about how the neighbor brought over some chocolate chip cookies the next day and he was savoring 
and he was telling me how he was biting into this chocolate chip cookie and, it, and he microwaved it so it was warm and melted. He's telling me the story of this immense pleasure that he was having from this cookie. That's exactly what grief looks like, to be able to set aside that intense yearning and then for a moment experience some some satisfying or positive experience, uh, emotion. But then over time, the periods of positive emotion tend to grow and the waves of really in-depth sadness and, and despair and uh, loneliness, they tend to shrink over time. And that usually means the person is adapting in some way. They're getting back into some routine and some sort of normal activities, always under the the lens of, you know, the significant change in their life. But they're they're sort of returning to kind of a new baseline, a new equilibrium, not just physiologically, but emotionally as well. And with complicated grief, we see people who stay in a very acute type of grief, you know, a lot of crying, a lot of um, guilt, a lot of thinking or feeling I could have, should have, would have, you know, that counterfactual thinking and not really being able to move forward. I mean, great complicated grief in a nutshell is grief that doesn't start, stop or move. And we, we know we would expect somebody who has lost their loved one two weeks or two months in to have a certain kind of set of, of symptoms. But if they were two years out or four years out or 20 years out, if they had those same symptoms for that loss, I think all of us would agree that that we're concerned about that. Mm-hmm. And um, Dr. Shear calls it, you know, adaptation. And then there's something that blocks the path of adaptation. So that that um, she always emphasizes that gr- the grief is not abnormal. We don't want to judge it or label it or, you know, even have to diagnose grief as some sort of pathology, but the blockages, the impediments, the things that are causing a person to get stuck are what are, I guess you can say, abnormal and need to be worked on. And they're usually, as you can guess, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Sometimes we see people early in grief, they They don't want to go to the hospital where the person died. They don't want to go to the school where their son went because their son died. They avoid certain things. But then gradually over time, in order to live life, um, maybe they have another child that's in the school and there's a parent needing, so they have to go. So they gradually confront the things that are really painful. And then like, like any exposure, they kind of desensitize to some things with the pain and can then go on living their life with with all these triggers. And a lot of people with complicated grief will avoid triggers and are afraid of the intense emotional response to the reminders. So we look at that avoidance and we see how that's helping the person and how it's hurting them or how it's not, not hurting them, but it's not helping them move forward in their lives. So thoughts, feelings. I've had support groups where people might be talking about hope. And then one client is sitting there going, I have no future. There's no no meaning and no purpose to my future without my husband. So when you see that, the flag goes up and, you know, this is sort of a response. You can tell, that's my point. You can tell who has complicated grief. And one thing to really emphasize is we don't diagnose complicated grief. We don't label it until one year, one year later after the death. And even that, people who have a suicide loss or maybe an ambiguous loss, you know, somebody died of an overdose and they're not sure if it's a suicide or an overdose or intentional or accidental. And they have to piece together a story that is tolerable for them. So those people will take longer to adapt to their grief. They're going to take longer, have, you know, really intense experiences of grief. And even for them, I would I would watch and wait and not sort of raise a flag up and say they have complicated grief. I would sort of look for those thoughts and feelings and behaviors that might be causing them to get stuck and address those. Yeah. 
Okay. So, well, I have a, I have a question, something I'm a little curious about. Do you see people seeming to be, I mean, you used this word earlier, dissociated. Do you see people who seem to be dissociated from their emotions about the loss? Like in, let's say it's been five years and in some areas of the person's life, they look like they've begun to integrate the life without the person they lost, you know, that they, they have interests, they have friends, they have, maybe if it was their partner, they have a new partner. Mm -hmm. And when they're with that person, they feel great and they enjoy spending time with them. And yes, they think about their deceased partner, but they don't, you know, they're not overwhelmed with emotion when thinking about that person within the context of the new relationship. But then there's another like part where they're alone, when they're alone, all these feelings come out or they're, you know, really overwhelmed with emotions, like to the point of maybe losing time, abusing substances. So it's almost like there's two ways of being. One is, you know, what we would call in the trauma world, what you would call like the going on with normal life part. And then the other part is the grieving part. Do you see that? Is that sort of a, a presentation of complicated grief? That's a really good question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, complicated. complicated. <laughs> it shows how complicated grief is, uh, separate from prolonged grief, um, that, you know, we grieve and we live at the same time. Yeah. And we take turns doing that, that we can, we never get rid of the grief, but something might come up that triggers it or reminds us of the person and that pang of sadness comes back to us but the the sort of I don't want to use the word normal but the typical grief response is that you feel it it hits you in some way but you can tolerate right the, the emotion with that pang of grief and then you can let it go and continue onward with your life and I think the complicated grief is when that pang of grief is so scary, the person avoids it mm -hmm. and doesn't want to feel it. And also the way that people say that they're living is, it's hard to describe, but they say that they're not fully alive, mm -hmm. that they're living their life, but it's something inside of them feels dead. Something inside of them has died with the person and they're going through the motions they're doing what they, quote, have to do. Or what Dr. Shear once said, they white knuckle themselves through life. Just, you know, maybe because socially and culturally they're expected to do that. And it's really hard work to have to face the, the pain and the feelings and consequences of the loss. I've had clients come in 15 years after their loved one took their lives or just a couple of days ago, somebody who came in 45 years after a death because a more recent death, a sort of normal aged parent death had re-triggered that grief that was never fully processed. So loss is complex. It builds up on each other, let multiple losses can, you know, often that's what I deal with in, in grief counseling. The, the numerous losses can make it, somebody feel so overwhelmed that they need to come and talk to talk to a therapist and make sure that they aren't going crazy. And often what we see are sort of people who are now alone, people who are the sole surviving member of their family and feeling really, really overwhelmed with that fact. And of course, with grief, we have fear and anxiety. Who's going to take care of me and addressing those that anxiety and helping that person find ways to cope with it are part of the process of the grief work. That's so interesting. And I think the last thing we have time for is for me to ask you about if there are any kind of, I don't know if you would call them risk factors or certain set of conditions that make someone more likely to have a complicated grief response rather than, you know, have the acute grief that passes after about a year. Right. No, right. that's a really good, good question. Also, that we can't, we can't predict exactly, but there's certain common patterns and traits. And Dr. Shear talks about this a lot. Sometimes it's a person who has an extremely close relationship 
with their loved one, um, a deeply interdependent relationship, somebody who might have very, have very high expectations for themselves, a perfectionist, for example, and who wants and tries to be as self-sufficient as possible. The bottom line is we cannot grieve alone. Grief, you know, tears and sadness were kind of evolved so that we could share them with others and others could support us. And, and that works most of the time after death for a couple months, if someone's lucky, lucky, but then the social network can kind of fade off and we have this expectation that we're supposed to get over our grief. But with complicated grief, often people withdraw because either people have said something to them, like, or shouldn't you, you know, you need to stop dwelling on your, your loss or something that makes them feel so different from others. They'll stop coming to support groups because they feel different from other grievers. So that that is another personality trait of just being very self-sufficient and yet suffering, suffering alone with their complicated grief. There's been sort of mixed evidence whether a, a traumatic death like a suicide or homicide would increase the risk of complicated grief. But certainly it's worth, you know, if somebody had a suicide or, or homicide, I would definitely just want to keep track of their their adapting to the loss and their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Child death is associated with complicated grief as well. I think that's pretty obvious why, because it's such a difficult and unnatural kind of death for a parent to go through. Um, so yes, that's a good question. There are certain traits to look out for. Somebody who has little self-compassion, who expects so much of themselves, and so judging grief and not accepting the grief and judging themselves and what they did wrong and the guilt they have, that will hurt their process of grief, won't help it. Yeah. So, and I do want to, as we finish up, I do want to talk about like the natural process of healing from grief. Okay. Healing implies that, you know, the wound is healed, but there's a scar. And so I don't want to imply that, that grief ends but it definitely can become a part of our lives. I mean, we can use the word integrated. It sort of becomes a, an experience that we put into one room of our house, which is our life, <laughs> if that makes sense. And we reconcile, we find some sort of peace and acceptance that this is part of our narrative. And we can, you know, in some cases, finding uh, healing means looking for some meaning some benefit from the loss. For example, you know, I have a woman last night who co-facilitates the suicide loss group with me and she lost her son to suicide and now has gone very much into this world of grief counseling and she has now co-facilitating with me. So that can give her a sense of meaning that all of this struggle has, has some purpose for her life. Um, so those are things that I look for when, we, when we're doing some grief counseling with people is how are they integrating with grief? How are they taking turns experiencing it and then setting it aside and looking at it in a different way? Yeah, I just wanted to share that because some people say, is go to a support group and they see somebody who's four years out and then they say, I don't want to keep coming to a grief group when I'm four years out. And I, I sort of offer that because everyone has their own path and maybe finding this community, a community of open-hearted, honest, authentic people who are hurting and who support each other is um, what draws people to continue coming to groups. And maybe there's still some piece that's unresolved and maybe they just want to be witness to how life is four years later without their spouse. And so Everyone has their own path. Everyone has their own kind of definition of what healing looks like. But like you're, like you said before in the, the example of it is possible for people to continue living their lives and look like they're functioning on the outside. And yet they're still carrying their grief. That's life, right? We all carry losses that we've had and continue to balance the difficult emotions of loss with the positive emotions of living our lives. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, you know, I love talking with you and I love exploring this topic because as painful as it is to lose someone you love, I think it's really helpful to hear 
you know, it's normal to feel the way you feel after losing someone and sort of have a little bit of a reality check about when to know that you need maybe a, a deeper level of support. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and there's this social adage, is that what you say? But there's a social phrase that says time heals, time heals all wounds. And many people say, well, like I guess I just have to endure this and every month passes and I'll get better. And to some extent, that's true because we have this natural intrinsic ability to adapt to a loss and, and move through the loss. But on other hands, it's not always true because if you see somebody stuck in their grief, time is not going to help. They're going to continue those um, thoughts, feelings, and, and behaviors that are preventing them from moving forward in their grief. So I think in our society, we need to be careful not to judge people in the first year or even two years of struggling with their loss, but also be concerned if they're not moving forward in two, three, four or five years. Yeah. And not to judge, but just to exactly. care and try to I help care. them. Yeah. Right. And and how are they functioning? You know, are they functioning like they're live again or are they functioning like they're like what we said before, just going through the motions? Yeah. And and number one is, you know, this idea of I'm sorry if I'm going on too long, but um, the idea that how are they functioning with regards to the person who died? Are they constantly still wishing they were here? Are they yearning with for them? Are they longing for them or have they integrated that person into their kind of spiritual and emotional world? Where if they find a, a parking space in a crowded mall, they say, thanks, mom, mm-hmm. or some sort of spiritual connection. Have they found a new relationship with that person who has died? That's what I call integrated grief. And it's very different. Some people who are, have complicated grief, still are tr- have trouble accepting the death and, and still yearning for the person as they were, the physical person with them. Yeah. That, thank you for taking the moment to add in integrating grief because, yeah, I think that's, that is a perfect place for us to end that, you know, to see what that would be like. Isabel, it's been a great pleasure to have you back on Therapy Chat today. I just, I value so much the work you're doing and the knowledge that you're sharing. It's so important. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for being so sensitive to the importance of all therapists understanding grief. Thank you for having me back. And I just so admire your, your role as the messenger and the cultivator of this wonderful way of sharing information with each other as therapists. I'm so grateful for what you do, and I'm honored to know you. So thank you. Oh, you're so kind. So, Isabel, do you want to tell people how they could get in touch with you if they wanted to maybe, I don't know, consult or... Yes, yes. Certainly. I'm here at Mission Hospice, and uh, our website is missionhospice.org, one word. And we are a very proactive community-based hospice with lots of different amazing community programs. We have a book series, a movie series, and lots of death cafes and um, workshops on end-of-life planning and grief, grief and bereavement. So um, certainly check out our website. And for me personally, I can be reached at istenzel at missionhospice.org. That's my email at work. And our number here is 650-554-1000. So thank you for reminding me to find a way to have people keep in touch. I'm, I'm very grateful for all the mentors in the grief counseling world. If anybody's interested in grief counseling, I would definitely encourage them to look into ADEC, the Association for Death Education and Counseling, which is a, has a wonderful conference and many webinars around grief and bereavement and grief therapy. Awesome. Thank you. We'll plug there. Yeah, we'll put their website in the show notes. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached to see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. 
Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.